Well, this is Mother's Day. We've been talking about leadership, and we're taking a break from the, the, today. Uh, next week, we'll be back in leadership. But don't forget, uh, coming up very soon, the Christian Growth Institute that I'll be teaching for the last time. And we need you to sign up for it. And it's at the Welcome Center. The sign-up sheet is at the Welcome Center. We need you to let us know, too, if you need a book. Um, and so, again, don't forget, and don't leave before, without signing up for that. Well, we've been talking, again, about leadership, but today it's about mothers. And you know, mothers can teach that which no other person can teach. Certainly, fathers can't teach. In fact, uh, there's great testimony about what mothers can teach. Um, in fact, someone put it this way. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until your father gets home. My mother taught me about receiving. You're going to get it when you get home. My mother taught me to meet a challenge. What were you thinking? Answer me when I talk to you. Don't talk back to me. (laughs) My mother taught me logic because I said so. That's why. And if you fall out of that swing and break your neck, you're not going to the store with me today. My mother taught me to think ahead. If you don't pass your spelling test, you'll never get a good job. (laughs) My mother taught me ESP. Put your sweater on. Don't you think I know when you're cold? My mother taught me how to become an an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. My mother taught me about genetics. You're just like your father. (laughs) And then finally, my mother taught me about independence. When that lawnmower cuts your toes off, don't come running to me. (laughs) Well, there's a modern proverb that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. There are many modern proverbs and ancient proverbs that are not true to the biblical text, but this one is. This one is. For it is the mother often who shapes the lives of so many children, many single mothers. If it weren't for single mothers, Who knows where their children would be, but mothers are the ones so often who shape the moral being, the moral foundation, the spiritual foundation of her children. It was interesting, a number of years ago, they used to think that uh, a child's uh, foundation, moral uh, uh, moral and spiritual foundation, would be established by the time they reached the age of eight. A few years ago, there was another research that was done on the same subject, and they concluded that it wasn't eight years of age that their foundation was established. It wasn't by eight. It was by three years of age. It has a lot to say, by the way, to a mother that we're going to talk about today, Hannah. Well, the Bible clearly documents the truths that I've just shared today, that the mother is the one who shapes often the children's moral and spiritual foundation. Now, I'm not saying that the father does not, but we do know that in most cases it is the mother who's with the child more than the father. The father, as you've heard me say many times, is to be greatly involved in the raising of the children. Uh, In Ephesians, it talks about that. But today, we're we're focusing on the mother. And today, we're going to look at two different stories, two different uh, mothers, two different sons. All that give us a contrast between how not to raise your child and how to raise your child. And today I hope that this will be an encouragement to you mothers and also a challenge to your mothers and grandmothers for that matter. Uh, I think one of the great travesties of our society today in America is that we think that once a child leaves the home after high school, that they're on their own, and, they're, and they are to in many respects. But in ancient times, in the New Testament, Old Testament times, families were intertwined, and they made decisions together, and, and the older parents taught the younger adults 
things to do. For example, Peter, just one case, Peter t- speaks and references the fact that the m- older mothers were to teach the younger mothers or wives how to love their husbands. That's just an, uh, uh, that's an inference that we draw from that, or one inference we draw from that is the fact that older parents should be, should never see themselves as done with being a mentor, if you have that open door, I should say. So we're going to look at two mothers today, and the first one is in Judges chapter 17, the one that Mark read earlier. Now the background of the book of Judges, just turn there by the way if you're not there, Judges 17. If you want to find out where Judges is, it's after, it goes after Joshua, and then you have another book, and then you have the book of Judges. I believe Um, So the background of the book of Judges is that it gives us the history of the nation of Israel after Joshua's generation died off. And it covers a period of about 300 years explaining what happened in the promised land between the conquest by Joshua and the rise of the monarchy under Saul and David. The title of the book comes from the, is given to us about, and it concerns the leaders during this period of time. Uh, who arose, leaders who were brought up and arose to bring about deliverance for Israel. And here's a footnote. When we think of judges, it's not the same thing as what we think of today. Often when we think of a judge, we think of people in, in black robes. But that's not the case here. The judge in this day had to do with the general, it was a general term to speak of a leader over the military and civil government. That also included strict judicial functions when needed. Uh, the, the word so pet in the Hebrew is the word for judge, and it means judge or deliverer. It's a very elastic word. So the book of Judges is about cycles, cycles of disobedience, cycles of discipline, repentance, and then deliverance. You see, in each instance in which the people of Israel moved away from God and then repented, God would raise up a deliverer. However, the generation after Joshua did not remain faithful, which led to a culture of decline. The people failed to drive out the pagan inhabitants, the Canaanites. In fact, they blended with the pagans, the Canaanites, people who, were, who practiced idolatry. And so as a result, God repeatedly delivered his people into the hands of the Gentile oppressors. Now, when we get to chapter 17, in fact, this whole last section of the book, five chapters, this section really serves more as an appendix because these last chapters are out of their chronological order as far as the previous chapters are concerned. While God was raising up unusual leaders from time to time to deliver his people from bondage, nonetheless, there were those, at least this section shows just how far Israel fell into pagan idolatry and thus disobedience to God. And the first narrative of spiritual corruption and compromise concerns a mother and her son. The story is of a man by the name of Micah, not, our pro- not the prophet you may know, who was raised in a very, and I'm, I put quotations around this, religious family. I'm not saying Christian, but a very religious household by her mother, by his mother, I should say. And she taught him many things. And so the question today is, what we want to see in, in here is, what did this mother teach Micah? Well, let's read verses 2 and 3. It says, He said to his mother, The eleven hundred pieces of silver which were taken from you, about which uh, you uttered a curse in my hearing, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. 
And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. He then returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I wholly dedicate the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, uh, now I will return them to you. Hmm. So what was the first thing that he taught or she taught? Micah. She taught him to lie. You say, what are you talking about? Micah's mother had 1,100 pieces of silver stolen from her, right? And so she pronounced a curse on those, whoever it was, not knowing that it was her son. She pronounced a curse on that person. Now, in extra, from extra biblical sources, we learn that a curse in that day was paralyzing. It was frightening. People were emotionally paralyzed by a curse. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 24, it says, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food under that curse. So perhaps a hearing of the curse by the son, Micah, caused him great pain, great fear. So Micah comes to his mother and says, Mom, do you remember that 1,100 pieces of silver that you had stolen from you? Uh-huh. Well, I, I took them. I took it. Hmm. The one you pronounce a curse on. But, Mom, I've got it right here. I, I'm going to give it all back to you since you pronounced a curse. And, and, and I, I don't want a curse on me. Now, she didn't appear to admonish him at all. She simply praised him for confessing his wrong, which is what a parent should do when a child steps forward and says, I'm guilty, right? But that affirmation should be tempered with instruction and admonishment about lying. About, and stealing, by the way, is lying. You know that, right? Uh, so basically, she said, what you did was fine. Now, I, my thoughts ran to the, uh, as I'm studying this this week, my th- thoughts ran to the, 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 the priest Eli. You remember Eli. In fact, we're going to look at him as well. He was a contemporary in this time. And you remember Eli was a godly man. He was the one that Samuel was, the Hannah took Samuel to. We'll go see that in a few moments. But in 1 Samuel, in fact, you might as well turn to 1 Samuel because um, it, we're going to be looking at this book in, in a few minutes as well. But just, so just mark 1 Samuel. But I want you to go over to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Now remember, Eli was a, a godly man, a priest, but he also incorporated or employed his sons in the work of the temple. And his sons were not godly, and they were ungodly, and they abused their privileges, and they abused uh, the people there. And they, Not only that, but they involved in illicit sex, sexual acts. And so news got out came to Eli, told him what was going on. Now, note what happens in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel 24 and 25. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. For, um, see, it's chapter 2, not 1. I'm, chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Now, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they, now listen, watch this. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now, what do we know about that? Eli admonished his sons, but he did nothing to stop their behavior. Essentially, that's what we see here in this context. You can turn back to to Judges 17. Let's read verses 3 and 4. 
It says in, in Judges 17, it says, He then returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I wholly dedicate the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. So, again, you see here, and, and, and note the phrase, she says, God bless you, my son. Or, and it literally in the Hebrew is, God bless you, my son of Jehovah. And then she says, I totally dedicated the money to the Lord. But then she says, and in honor of you being such an outstanding son and stealing and giving it back, <laughs> I'm going to have an idol made in your name to the Lord. Not only that, but I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> Two things here. She was a religious person. In fact, I would call her one of the, what we called when we did the study on the book of James. The, the, the series I did on the book of James, I entitled it A Case Against Professional Christianity. There are people in our world today, in our church, even in, in churches around the world, who are professional Christians. They know, how to, they know the language to speak. They know all the nice platitudes. They, they talk Christianese. But something lacks in their hearts. They're not totally dedicated to the Lord. She was that type of person. She was religious. If you knew all the holy hiccups, I would say. <laughs> but look what she said. She says, what would she say in verse 3? I am wholly dedicated. That word holy, in Hebrew, kodash, means sanctified, set apart. She said, I am so committed to the Lord here. But her actions said otherwise. Somewhat like Ananias and Sapphira of Acts 5. Micah's mother pledged one thing to God, but then did something far less. It's like, it's like someone saying, I'm going to give a donation to the church in your name, son. You're such a wonderful, I'm going to give $20,000 to the church or whatever it may be. But I'm going to make a statue. Oh, no, let's take it back. I'm going to, I so am going to dedicate this money to you that I'm going to go out and buy you a new car that cost only 20000 you see, it was absurd. What she was doing was, she was saying, I'm going to dedicate this to the Lord, but her actions said that she was more dedicated to someone else, to her son. So, there's another thing that she taught Micah about God, especially in verse 2 we see, she said, the Lord, blessed be my Son by the Lord. Now, in, in verse 2, that's a text, the, the word she uses for Lord is, text, is a textor grammaton. What is a textor grammaton? It's, it's a, a, an abbreviation, a transliteration that's associated with the holy name of God. The name Jehovah was a, so, so, so revered by the people in that day, the Hebrew people, that they said, we're not even going to pronounce the name Jehovah. It's too, it's too holy to, do, uh, to, to pronounce. So after the second, third century, they did not pronounce. They simply just used the consonants. Uh, they used the Yod, He, Wa, He. That's a, in, in our English, you would, it would be Y-H-W-H, Jehovah, or J-H-W-H. That's all they were, but they would, when they came to pronouncing that, when they would write that down, when they came to pronouncing that, they wouldn't say Jehovah, they would say Adonai, or Lord, or Elohim. So the point here is that Micah's mother knew about the supreme God, Jehovah. The fact that she knew not to pronounce the name Jehovah told you that she knew something beyond the surface about God, but nonetheless, she corrupted the knowledge of God by mixing idolatry with it in two ways. 
So now here's number two. The second thing she taught him was how to corrupt the knowledge of God. She had an idol made with a portion of silver that she had donated for that purpose. But by doing this, she was in violation of the command of God in Deuteron- Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 15. It said, Cursed be the man that makes any graven or molten image. She showed that in her mind, the God of Israel was no different. Now watch this. That the God of Israel was no different than any other God, for they too represented images. But she also corrupted the knowledge of God and Jehovah by teaching Micah that, that through her cursing of one and blessing of another, that the money, doing that with the money, that basically you can call upon God, that God's just like any other God, Jehovah's just like any other God, that you can call upon and he will react to you and act in your favor on the whims or the capricious whims of anyone's emotions. And that's a no-no. God says we have a problem with that. Which, of course, undermines the sovereign will and control of God. Now, there's something else that she communicated that I have seen a lot over the years in mothers. She communicated that her child was more important than God to her. We're not going to turn there, but in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, after God spoke to Eli about his not taking care of his sons, and he pronounced a, 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 basically a, a form of discipline, divine discipline, on, on, on uh, uh, Eli. He said to him at that point, he said, why do you disrespect my sacrifices? In other words, why do you come to worship God and you ignore this large sin in your family? He says, you honor, and this is what he said. He said, you honor your son more, or sons more than you honor me. By her honoring her son with a statue, she was essentially saying, you are like God. You are more uh, equally as important as God. So here's the third thing she taught him. She taught him how to make her son an idol. You might want to write over the word son. She taught how to make, how to make a child an idol. Mother's don't make graven images today in the name of their children. But I have seen many who treat their children as if they are gods. And by the way, that, that condemnation of God on Eli told me something. Eli was a godly man. But he had this blaring weakness. It was about his own children. You can be a godly person. You can go to church. And yet, in a subtle way, if you're not careful, you can lift your children up to the level of idolatry. Oh, wow. Did you say that? (laughs) So what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. Over the years, I've seen mothers and fathers, for that matter, when it comes to boys, who who their whole self-image is based upon how their children do. They almost reincarnate their lives through their children. All they want to talk about is about their children. Now, we all want to talk about children. But there's a balance to be had when it comes to our children. <clears throat> our self-image, our identity should not be based upon our children, how they do or how, they don't, how well they don't do. Our self-image and identity should be based upon who we are in Christ, that God loves us and accepts us. So many times when parents have trouble with children, and I've been in counseling sessions when this has occurred. The child is becoming a young adult and, 
and, and the parent is wanting the control over that child. Why do they want control over that child? Well, I can go into a number of reasons why, but one of the reasons is they have been living their lives through that child, and now that child's not going in the direction that they want because they want that child to be this. Abraham, God, this child is yours. Charles Spurgeon, who was known as the Prince of Preachers in England for many years, all pastors have books by Charles Spurgeon. He said this, Favorite children are often the cause of much sin in believers. The Lord is grieved when he sees us doting upon them above Note this, above measure. They will live to be a great curse to us as Absalom was to David, or they will be taken from us to leave our homes desolate. If Christians desire to grow thorns to stuff their sleepless pillows, let them dote on their dear ones. Good counsel. Balance is the key. We all love our children but we need to recognize that our children also have sin natures like all of us. They can do wrong. Some parents think their children can't do any wrong. Just talk to my wife, who is a professor of college students, who parents even try to call her and talk to her. My, my, my kid can't be failing. Oh, my kid can't be cheating. So, well, what kind of impact did she have on Micah? The impact is obvious. First we read that he, in verse 5, it says, the man Micah had a shrine, a shrine, and he made an ephod and household idol, consecrated one of his sons, and consecrated one of his sons, that he might become his priest. (laughs) Who in the world gave him the right to consecrate his son and to declare him as, as priests. <laughs> the word shrine, literally in the Hebrew, means house of God. So like a small domestic chapel in which he kept his idol, it was a specific place where he could go and worship his God in his house on his own terms. And this was only an act of arrogance and self-will. Because to do such would be contrary to the word of God because the word of God commanded the Hebrew people to avoid these shrines. They were to worship God at Shiloh, at the town where the tabernacle was and where he had chosen, he had told people, God had chosen this place for his people to worship. In fact, it is very interesting that in Leviticus chapter 17, God essentially, watch this, God essentially says the sacrifice at any other place other than the place I tell you and instruct you was to worship demons, not him. Now, unfortunately, Michael wasn't used to such a God. After all, his mother basically taught him that you could call upon God at any time, and God would just like a genie in a bottle, God would pop up out of that bottle and do whatever you want him to do. He didn't know a God who said, It's not about you, it's about me. So here's the first thing. His mother basically taught him, or at least her impact on him, caused him to have a distorted image of God. A distorted image of God. Now, a a distorted image of God can come in many shapes and forms. Let me give you an example of this. Just to, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, but this is by Neil Anderson. It's, I think it's in one of his books. Neil was a classmate of mine, a wonderful guy. But he, he basically talks about distortions of God's image. And here's what he's, he, he does. He's on the left-hand side, he says, I renounce the lie that my Heavenly Father is distant and disinterested. I announce the truth that my Heavenly Father is intimate and involved. 
I renounce, in other words, the, I renounce the distorted image that God is insensitive and uncaring. I proclaim him, I worship him, that he's kind and passionate. I renounce the distorted image that he's stern and demanding. And I, ex- I praise him for the fact that he's accepting, filled with joy and love. Now, he's not accepting of our sin, mind you, but he's accepting of each of us as his children. We, he says, I denounce the image that God is passive and cold. Rather, he is warm and affectionate. I denounce the distorted image that he's absent and too busy for me. And I proclaim him and praise him that he's always with me, eager to be with me. I renounce the image, the distorted image that he's never satisfied with what I do, or impatient and always angry. Some of you have that image of God and you've never gotten over that. But rather he's patient, slow to anger. I renounce the distorted image that he's mean and cruel and abusive, and I announce him as loving and gentle and protective. I denounce that he takes all the fun out of life. No, he's full of grace and mercy. We'll stop right there, but as you see, you understand that people can have distorted images of God. Now, I've just shared with you the positive side of some of the distorted images of God. But one of the negative sides that I see in in the church today in America is that God is all about me, they basically teach. And here's God is to help you. And so come this Sunday and we'll teach you how you can do this. Come next Sunday and we'll teach you how you can do this. Come next Sunday and we'll teach you how God's gonna bless you if you'll just, oh look, there are times that you need to deal with needs in people's lives. But God is not first and foremost about our needs. He's first and foremost about him. And as we seek to know him and align our hearts with him, then he begins to bless our lives. But it's no, there's no deal here. There's no deal made with God. That's what she taught him. In verses 8 through 13, we see that basically, well, let's just read verse 18. It says, Then the man departed from the city, from Bethlehem in Judah, Judah, to stay whenever or wherever he might find a place. And as he made his journey, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in, in in Judah, and I'm going to stay wherever I may find a place. Now, who is a, what's important, what's significant about him saying that I'm a Levite? Where did priestly, where did the priests come from? The tribe of Levi. They were Levites. So what happens here? Micah said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your, main, and your maintenance. So the Levite went in. And the Levite agreed to live with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And so Micah, watch this, Micah consecrated the Levite. Again, I ask the question, who gave him the right to consecrate the Levite? And the young man became his priest and lived in the house, his house. So, so here's the second thing. He had a flawed theology. He had a flawed theology. A Levite is passing through, and he talks him into being his personal priest. And then he says, now I've got my own personal Levite as a priest. So certainly God would be pleased with that, right? Now, is that good theology? No, not hardly, not hardly. So we see what a mother whose theology is incorrect, her view of God is incorrect, is distorted, in fact, how that filtered through to her son. Now, let's look at the godly mother. Let's turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 1. I said earlier you go past, actually you you go past the book of Ruth and go to 1 Samuel from Judges, and there you find 1 Samuel. 
1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'm going to have to walk you through this story for the sake of time. This is a story about a man named Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Now, Peninnah had two sons, had two children, I should say. Hannah had none. So Hannah went into a deep depression, even about her not having children. But she was a godly woman. Because she was a godly woman, she processed it correctly. She went to God and said, God, I, 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 want you, I wish you would give me a child, that I, I could have a child, make me able to have a child. And if you do, I will dedicate him back to you. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1, let's pick it up in verse 20. It says, and it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked of him of the Lord, asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up to all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Now, what did godly Hannah teach Samuel? Well, she clearly believed in the Lord. You can tell that she believed in the Lord. So she understood that worship was to be done at the right place, at, only at Shiloh. She didn't make any homemade shrine. She didn't come up with her own God. So number one, she taught him to believe in God. You say, well, Barm, shouldn't there be more evidence than that? Well, if you look back in verse 11 of this chapter, it says, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, um, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Now watch this. And a razor shall never come on his head. What do we know about that? What's that alluding to? She raised him as a Nazarite. A Nazarite was to be raised under the strict laws of God. So she, from the, from the get-go, she raised him as a Nazarite. Now, there were two types of Nazarites, by the way, just, as, just, as, just a footnote here. There were two types. There were temporary Nazarites, uh, and then there were permanent. And there, we don't know much of permanent Nazarites. We know of three. Samuel was one. Care to guess the other two? Samson and John the Baptist. Samson was not a good Nazarite, but Samuel was. So number one, she taught him, uh, two, she also taught him to understand and trust in the sovereign will of God as he pleases. This was evident in her prayer as she prayed with a disposition that God could either give her a child or could choose not to. You get that? She said, God, if it be your will, but I want your will first. If that, mean, if, that if your will means I not have a child, then I'm okay with that. Of course, she didn't break her promise as Micah's mother did. And thirdly, she, she taught him how to understand and obey the word of God. This was in, indicated by her vow to raise her son a Nazarite again, which meant, again, that she would not allow him to touch anything that would be. It, a Nazarite was to separate himself from the things of the world. He was not even to have his hair cut. He was not even touch wine, let wine touch, touch his lip. He was to live, again, under the strict law of God. And look at verse 28 in that chapter. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord 
and he worshiped the Lord there. She took him to the, the temple, gave him to Eli, said at three years of age, gave him to, but even by that three, you remember what I said earlier? By that third year of his life, he had already learned much about God and about how to obey God from his mother. Three years of age. Hannah walks into the temple and walks up to Eli and says, Excuse me, sir, the priest, but you remember that woman a few years back that stood beside you and prayed that God would give her a child? Well, God gave just what I asked. And I promised that I would dedicate, remember that? I promised I would dedicate him to you, and, and here he is, Eli, and I'm leaving him here with you. And the story goes, and the word of God tells us that every year, she only got to see her son once a year. Can you imagine that? She only got to see her son once a year, but every time she went to make the sacrifices, she came with his, a robe, a new robe for him. And later on, Samuel became a great man in the sight of all of Israel. So how did Samuel, and I'm moving quickly here, how did, uh, what was Hannah's impact? Let me kind of walk through these. He was able to live properly and obediently in the house of God. Look at verse 26. For Samuel. She said, oh my Lord, as your son lives, my Lord, I am a woman who stood here beside you praying. And, uh, and it says, uh, Anyway, we, we see here, that's not exactly the, the verse I'm looking for. But the, the point here is that he was a, a man who lived, it says that he grew in stature and in might before all of Israel. It also, he, he was in, able to have a major impact on the nation of Israel. Now, in chapter 3, and this should be correct, in chapter 3, verse 10 it says, Thus the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And, and, and Samuel said, Speak to your servant. Listening. Remember the story? That while Samuel was with Eli, and they were both asleep, God came to speak to Samuel, called out to him. Samuel had never heard God's voice. And so he thought it was Eli calling him. And so he says, Speak to me. You know, basically saying to Eli, what is it you have to say to me? Here I am, I'm, I'm here waiting for you. He's, and Eli says, I didn't call you. Then the, in verse 11 says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And then he goes on and look in verse 19. It says, Thus Samuel grew and grew, here's the verse. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall. That means he had an impact on Israel. God favored him. God's hand was upon him. And where did it begin? It began with his mother. Here's a chart to kind of re, to rehash kind of what you see. The impact of Micah. His impact, he had an entire tribe of Israel destroyed. Samuel had a nation spared. The name of Jehovah, Micah minimized the name of Jehovah. Samuel exalted the name of God. The things of God were commonplace to Micah. It didn't mean that much to him. To Samuel, he revered them. Destinies, Micah's was eternal separation. Samuel was eternity with God. Let me just give you just four applications here, and I, I'm going to give, um, and then I want to pray for the mothers. Number one, all children have sin natures. Realize that your children have sin natures, and your grandchildren have sin natures. And you need to love them, but you also need to recognize, just as you should have a healthy, a healthy respect of, or I should say disrespect, of your, of your old sin nature. In other words, all of us, if we're walking with God, should recognize that there's an old nature inside of us that wants to turn us away from the things of God. That same nature lives in your children and in your grandchildren. 
They need guidance. They need direction. Number two, your children will do as you do, not as you say. Someone has said it well, and it's true. Truth is better caught than taught. Thirdly, communicating of truth to your children is vitally important. Do not underestimate the words that you share with your children, even when they turn their nose up at it. And number four, your children belong to God. Your children belong to God. They're loaned to you for a season. How could Abraham give Isaac to God, thinking he's going to kill him? Because he recognized that his son belonged to God. God was the one who promised him. God was the one who delivered him, del- delivered a son to him. Now, at this time, we want to recognize our mothers. And so, mothers, we want to pray for you. We want to pray your blessing, God's blessing upon you. Even as a grandparent, you have, still have a role to play in the lives of your children and grandchildren. They need counsel. They need advice. Sometimes they may not want that advice. And you have to be careful whether you have an open door for that. One thing we say to our children, we said, if you mess up in your life, there's collateral damage that all parents experience. So you can take what we say as truth or you reject it. But we're not going to sit back and see you walk down the wrong path. I think that's biblical. They may get offended. They may may not come for Thanksgiving or whatever it might be. But you've done what God's called you to do. Mothers, stand up. Let us love on you a little bit. Let's give these mothers a round of applause, right? Now, while you remain standing, let me pray for you. Father, the world tells us that motherhood is secondary. It's it's past. It's no longer the position that we used to revere. But Lord, I pray you would encourage these mothers and grandmothers to be godly mothers and grandmothers, to not give way to the world and its ways. Give good godly counsel when they need to. Give them the courage and the strength to do that when it might be unpopular in their family. Lord, help them to grow most of all in you so they may grow and grow in your word so they may give good counsel. They may be uh, prodded by the Holy Spirit when to give that counsel. And Lord, may you encourage them that they, they occupy the highest position there is below heaven. Encourage them. Thank you for them, Father. We're so blessed and so thankful for each one of them. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.